Okay, let's get started. Uh, hi everyone, hope you're doing well. Um, first off, thanks to Masa and uh, Jewish Agency for uh, inviting me to give this workshop today. My name is Jay Rosen. Uh, you can hear from my accent. I'm originally from the United States. I've been living in Israel now for just over 13 years. Um, and what we're going to do today is something I do with a couple other actually Masa programs. Um, undergraduate, graduate, even young professionals, um, even older professionals, frankly, is a um, really practical based workshop that's about you um, and how to take whatever experience you've had in Israel and whatever program you're on and turn it to something that's um, understandable for any pretty much any opportunity you want in the world, whether it's academic, whether it's personal, whether it's um, uh, you name it. Basically, how, how to communicate the program you're on and your experience in Israel in general to whatever you want to do next. Um, we're going to try to do this as, I'm going to try to do as some interactive part. It's a little hard with Zoom, of course. Um, but I want to give you some takeaways that you can work on on your own and maybe we can schedule a meeting um, in the near future and I'll be happy to give you my contact info so we can go through more. Um, but I really want to focus this to be a starting conversation um, and then give you the tools that you can start working on this on your own. For some of you, this may be a review. For some of you, you've never heard this before, um, but I hope you can all take this to heart and start learning and by extension, telling your programs and other people who are encouraging you um, either to come to Israel, to tell your story, why this is an important set of skills. So a little bit about myself before we get started, although it's definitely part of what we're gonna be talking about today. So as I said, I'm originally from the United States. I made Aliyah just about almost 14 years ago at this point. Um, I live in Tel Aviv now. I started my own business about two and a half years ago called Hayati which if you transliterate it means my tailor in Hebrew, but it also means my life in Arabic. And it's very much a combination of everything I've done in my life, which is, which really started my first trip to Israel. My first trip to Israel was now, wow, 20 years ago, yikes. Um, I went to a Jewish day school. I grew up with a very strong Jewish education and identity, but no connection to Israel whatsoever. I don't have immediate relatives here. I'd never been here before. Um, everyone else in my class seemed to have been here, or relatives. I certainly conversed with a lot of Israelis. I certainly spoke Hebrew before I came here, but it didn't mean anything to me. And to be perfectly honest, the first time I was here, I really didn't like Israel. It was February 2000. It was cold. It was wet. Um, being a high schooler from the United States in the late 90s, the sight of people my age and slightly older walking around with guns, no matter how justified, really irked me. Everyone seemed to have a connection with Israel and I wasn't getting it. And then I found small ways to connect, whether it was on my own, whether it was seeing people who looked like myself and not like the typical American walking around. And then I started college. I went to NYU undergrad and I started in September 2000, which those of you who know a little bit of Israeli history know that's the start of the second intifada. And almost instinctively, I felt the need to, I felt an obligation to share my experience in Israel. It was a very peaceful time when I lived here in Israel for four months. Um, and to share my education, I had always been interested in the Middle East and the diversity of it. And to pay that forward, because there was so much disinformation happening on campus, but more importantly, so many Jewish students who couldn't talk for themselves. They couldn't share their own experiences. They couldn't find the words, much less the power and the ability and the confidence to speak aloud, but they couldn't even find the words. I would go to events where there may be a an interfaith dialogue and there would maybe be two students out of 20 who would actually speak um, from a Jewish or Israeli perspective. And it made me realize I have this tremendous gift. I had this tremendous opportunity to learn and to be in Israel. I subsequently came back to Israel a lot during college. And I, I felt the need to give back because I saw not enough people were doing the same, but also so many other people were having similar experiences to myself. They may have been the most Jewish day school, summer camp, Hillel, Chabad, whatever experience, but it wasn't meaning anything personal to them. They hadn't made that personal connection yet. 
So despite not wanting to do anything Jewish, because I thought I was tired of it, after university, I ended up working for Birthright Israel right after university for two years. Um, specifically working on alumni relations in the DC area. I came to Israel obviously a lot. I spoke with a lot of students like myself, completely different than myself, but found their way to connect and to communicate about what they experienced in Israel and what that meant for them in a larger context. Um, I moved to Israel, I kept working for Tagli, I then worked for the Jewish Agency for a bit. I then worked for many years at Tel Aviv University, running one of the Masa programs there, one of the international graduate degree programs. I then worked in PR, helping people find their voice and communicate what they do specifically in lifestyle industry here in Israel. So hotels, restaurants, anything that you ever heard about Israel in the last several years in the biggest of um, uh, media outlets like New York Times, Cosmopolitan, Vogue, Condé Nast Traveler, that was our PR agency. And then I started my company because I realized I wanted to combine all that together, but frankly, I've been doing the same thing all along. I've always been talking about how to connect Israel with what I'm personally interested in and how to express Israel in a nuanced, accessible manner and how I can help others do that. So two things. One, that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to help you start creating that narrative for yourself. But number two, I hope you paid attention to how I spoke about myself. Yes, there were parts I was being a little bit more bragging, some parts I was being more um, modest. Not everyone is there with their confidence to speak in front of a public, whether it's on a screen like we are now or in person. Um, but part of what I want you to start thinking about today is that narrative that I just took you through. Even if there isn't that one or two th factors that are um, sewing together everything we're talking about, that's going to be important to share your experience of understanding where you are right now, wherever you are in Israel, or if you're not in Israel right now, where this fits into what you've just done before coming to Israel, and what you want to do next. This is for whether you are North American, South American, European, whatever, and whatever you want to do. If you are just out of high school, if you are in college, if you're about to graduate college, it doesn't matter. To start building that narrative about yourself, even if it's not so coherent yet, is gonna be really important. Many of you know this already. If you've applied for a college, you know this already. Probably you had to do something similar to your, for your MASA program to participate. You had to share, why am I interested? What am I doing right now? Why am I interested in coming to Israel? What do I hope to take out of it? That experience, that reflective experience is integral for whatever you're gonna do in life. What I want to start now is talking about why Israel, why this experience in Israel is important, how to feed that in, and then start to unpack together the practicalities of it, what that can look like. Um, by the way, if you have any questions while we're going, feel free to type them in the chat window. I'll try to stop at certain points to ask any questions. Also, if you want to raise your hand, physically or otherwise, by all means do it. Um, so why abroad? Those of us from um, North America to particularly the United States know this. Um, we're told again and again, study abroad is an important experience for our college experience. Many of us have international experience even before we get to university. Even if that's personal, frankly, that can be an integral part of forming and shaping who we are. Um, we know this in America, not just uh, through qualitative um, feedback of it was very important for me to have this experience or I, as an employer or a university, was looking for people who already had international experience. We know this by the numbers. We see how much universities push people to study abroad. We see how much um, employers and graduate schools are looking for that experience, and how much that is weighted for them. We see this in other places as well. Let's not just talk about the Americans, the Europeans here, Erasmus. Erasmus is basically built into your university experience where you are asked to travel across the EU and by extension other places that are part of the Erasmus program to enrich, to fulfill, to complete your experience. Um, we know this, we know how important the international experience is and yet many people write off the Israel part for various reasons. Um, many people don't know how to effectively communicate a program abroad that isn't an academic one, right? If you are 
doing a volunteer program, or if you're doing, even if you are in yeshiva, or you're learning um, for learning sick in a Jewish context, those institutions, with all due respect, don't actually teach you, help you communicate why that is important, how to fit that into your larger narrative, how to sell that as part of who you are. And also, we can even take a step back about universities. All of the universities we've ever gone to and will go to have a Department of Career Services. I would venture, if I were to show, a ra if I were to ask you to raise your hands right now, um, I won't because not everyone has their camera on and that's cool. Um, I would say a small fraction of you have gone to career services. Doesn't matter where you're from, I will gather the vast majority of you have never gone there. It's not a thought that we think of, right? Nor, and it's important, our university, our individual program, our, our academic program never pushed us to go there. Maybe they told us about it at um, uh, orientation our first week when we were so overwhelmed by everything else. Maybe they told us very much at the end, right before we were getting our cap and gown to check out career services. But the fact they weren't th having us think about what's the day after and how do our studies fit into that is gonna be very important um, and is why a lot of people play catch up. I'll give you a great example of what happens here in Israel um, for those who are interested in making Aliyah. So I graduated with a very unique program, which was all about this. I designed, I designed my entire undergraduate degree. I had to pick every class I took and I had to form it into one cohesive major. It was basically a thesis um, for an undergraduate degree. And I talked to other people here who did a liberal arts or humanities degree. And they are totally overwhelmed by the entire job process in Israel. They have no idea how to look for a job here. And when they tell people what they studied, especially when it's liberal arts, history, language, philosophy, literature, those places don't know how to hire them. Now, that's a whole other thing about Israel and human resources. It doesn't exist, by the way, in Israel. Spoiler alert, it doesn't exist. Um, but they don't even know how to communicate themselves because their programs never taught them. I want to show you something I did for a Masa program where I did a similar workshop about how to communicate yourself effectively. I'm going to pull it up and this is just their example, um, but it illustrates a simple exercise that you can already do yourself. So what I had them do, this was a graduate degree program at Tel Aviv University. Um, and normally I do this on a big uh, white screen, but instead we did it um, on a, on a um, spreadsheet here. I asked them to type or to say aloud all the different things they've learned in the program up till now. We did this about a month and a half ago. So about two thirds of the program was already done. What are the topics that they learned or just anything that they've learned? This is these columns here, D and E, okay? You see all the different things they learned, all the different topics, all the different subjects, let's call it. And then I started breaking it down for them as they were doing this. Usually when I do this in person, I do this as they're um, saying them out and I already flushed them in. But as we were talking, I started putting them into two different categories, topics and hard skills, okay? Topics, these are things that were specific to their program, no less important, but they were specific to their experience in Israel. So this is a program in conflict resolution and mediation. So they learned everything from negotiation to leadership, to game theory, religion, but they also learned research. Some of these people have never done a research course before. And so then I started to put that into hard skills. Okay, what of these topics are actually skills? What are actual things they can take away and aren't topic dependent? If I didn't say that I studied in a conflict resolution mediation program, where else could I use what I learned in other settings? So one of them is negotiations, right? Negotiations you need in politics, you need in law, you need in everyday communications, you need with your family, you need with your friends. That's a hard skill that you can apply to a variety of places. Mediation, same idea. Um, group dynamics and facilitation, leadership, game theory, grant writing. Even if you don't know what all these things are, that's okay, because this is about their program. But the point is, these are all things, these hard skills, I pulled out from 
36 different students in a very interdisciplinary program. I pulled out what they were studying and immediately could find the skills that were relevant to all of them and are frankly relevant to a lot of places outside of their program. I want to focus, and for, before we get to the, the second part, I want to encourage you, by the way, all of you to do this um, exercise. If you live with people in your program, it's a great idea. Even though on your own, it's a great idea. Start listing all the different things you've done in your program. Anything, really, just let your mind go. Don't judge any of it. Start listing it, and then break it into two top two categories. One are um, experiences or opportunities that are you could only have in that program. And the other ones are things that you can probably apply to other places. So like negotiations, like I said, is another one. Three of these hard skills that I pulled out, and I wrote them here in bold for this um, program, and I, and I also want to emphasize it here because, again, not knowing what programs you're on, not knowing how old you are, where you're from, I would venture not only a lot of you didn't go to career services, but probably a lot of you have some background in the liberal arts humanities, even social sciences, but certainly liberal arts and humanities, I'm guessing. Even if I'm wrong, I'm still right in the following thing. Um, when I tell people why they're so worried about the job market, whether it's here in Israel or in the United States or in Europe, they're like, I don't know how to translate my studies or my experience to other people. I don't know how to do it. No one ever told me to do it. And I said, well, did you go to career services? Yeah, we heard about that, but I didn't know where to go. And then I say, okay, so tell me what you studied. And they'll tell me they studied English literature. Okay, so tell me about English literature. What did you do? Well, we had to read X number of novels. We had to find out the story behind those novels. We had to pair them in a larger context, sociological context and historical context. We had to do um, some comparison with those other people behind them. And I said, what you just said to me in a few sentences is three are three skills that any job, any, any job needs in an employee, whether or not they know it or not. And like I said, Israel doesn't have pretty much any HR, but even other people around the world don't recognize these three skills as being integral to pretty much any place you would work, any place you apply for graduate school, anything you want to do in life. One is research, second is analysis, and three is writing. That may seem super obvious. Some of you may be going, duh, and I can't hear it, and that's cool. Um, but the fact of the matter is, these are duh, but the amount of people who don't realize they have three hard skills that are needed in every job, in every academic setting, both on the person who's making the decision to hire or to accept, and the person who's meant to do the position, is a testament that these are very much taken for granted, and they shouldn't be because you don't, you aren't born with these. This isn't, same thing as leadership. You're not born a leader. You were not born with research analysis and writing skills. You had to go through training to do that. In some capacity, you've done that in your life. Let's, at the very least, of whatever Masa experience you're on, take out three skills that you can apply to anything you want to do in the future. And these are a great place to start. Research analysis and writing. What am I talking about? Number one is research. Now, I know things are different from when I went to university as opposed to now, but I hope you all know you don't do research by asking a question on your Facebook wall or in your Instagram feed, whatever social media you have and depend on feedback just on that. Just as you probably hopefully know, hopefully know, um, not to do all your research just on Wikipedia. You know how to research and access material, right? You know how to do whether it's a Google search, whether it's JSTOR, whether it's LexisNexis, whatever academic or professional database is out there, you already know how to do that. That, by the way, sets you apart in a lot of places. I'll give you a great example. Uh, I'll give you many examples. But again, here in Israel, liberal arts education barely exists. There are very few places that have a similar degree. And so the research skills that you are learning or have learned or will learn that are applicable to so many different 
disciplines. The fact that an English major can go and use a library. They know how to use a library. They know how to use online databases to find research to pull together. And then to do the diligence to find, is that article trustworthy or not? Is it accurate or not? Is it reflective of actual evidence or actual supporting proof? Um, or is this fake news? That kind of research should never be taken for granted because clearly all we have to do is open up our social media. We see how many of our friends, how many of our family members are posting garbage, right? Fake news. This is the era of fake news. How many of our loved ones have done that? And how much do, have we rolled our eyes and wanted to respond or not respond and been frustrated? I can't believe they didn't read that and then that. That's that research skills that we already have. That gets into the second one, analysis. We know how to read these pieces of information. We can tell a, if we were called into the boss or the person just under the boss and to say, is this report accurate? Is this article true that Israel is the world's largest uh, user of Facebook per capita? Is this true? Can you prove this to me? My answer would be yes, because, and then I show them the analysis based on whatever they're showing me, based on whatever research I've done in preparation I've done in my past. And the third is writing. And writing, my, my, I can't emphasize this one enough, and this goes whether you're a natural a native English speaker or not. Um, my whole business is about helping people with their cross-cultural communications. You won't believe, or maybe you will believe because you've spent enough time in Israel, um, the amount of people who believe they have great English and they have terrible English and they never learned expository writing. They never learned creative writing. They never took the time to actually write out their thoughts so that they can be heard. A lot of us are so concerned about being heard. Um, so much of us are concerned about being heard. We're not actually the, taking the time to ensure we are. Um, and I do this a lot with clients who are looking to pitch themselves in front of investors, in front of donors, um, people who are really dependent on other people understanding what they want to do, and they can't communicate. Um, and it brings up some very hard truths for some of my clients to understand that just because it's your idea doesn't mean you're the best leader. And just because you're the leader doesn't mean you're the best spokesperson for it. And writing is a part of that communication skills. It's not just about talking, it's also about writing. How can I effectively explain to someone in the course of 140 characters on Twitter, my opinion? And if I can't do that, um, how else can I articulate myself? So I'm gonna stop sharing that. Um, that documentation, which I got to the end of in writing is really key to explaining your experience in Israel, um, explaining it to a completely different audience. You, well, again, whether you are entering university, you're in the middle of your studies, you're graduating soon, you're in the middle of your graduate studies, you have no idea what's next. Um, you have the opportunity to document and communicate what you're experiencing, what you have experienced in Israel, what you're experiencing now, what you could be doing later um, and that will set up all sorts of opportunities for you that you don't even know about yet. I'll give you an example before we get into how to actually do it. Um, when I used to run the graduate degree program at Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv University, um, we used to have a weekly session of guest speakers. It was enrichment, but it was really about translating what they're studying into practicalities, what you can study, what you can do with this degree, because it's such an interdisciplinary program. People were coming from all over the place. One of the people I brought in, I actually ended up going to graduate school, um, high school with, excuse me. Um, I grew up with her. She was in Egypt in 2010, 2011, during the revolution, during the Arab Spring, particularly in Egypt. And she told the story, a nice Ashkenazi Jewish woman from suburban Maryland, in the United States, telling her story, how she ended up in Egypt in the first place, studying Arabic and how she got out. And it was a super compelling story. And one of the reasons why it was so compelling wasn't just the content of the story, 
She knew how to tell a story. She had done enough experiences, not just telling the specific story again and again, but she knew how to grab an audience fast. Flash forward, she now works for one of the biggest um, startup accelerators here in Israel and around the world um, called Mass Challenge, where I also um, uh, do some consulting for them as well. So you never know who your audience is. You never know who you're going to speak to. And it's a great opportunity to start putting together all your different experiences and to make them effective. It's not just listing like I just did. Listing is a very important first step. Number one is listing. Everything I've done and everything that I can take out of that and apply to multiple places. That's the first step. The second one is how do I get heard, right? How do I turn that into a story? Um, in the startup world, which I do a lot of work with, Storytelling is one of the biggest buzzwords you keep hearing again and again and again. Any of you who've done anything with innovation and entrepreneurship know that as well. Um, storytelling, how do you tell a story? For any of you who've ever watched a TEDx or a TED talk, TEDx is pretty much bigger than TED right now, you know this, right? There's a format, how you tell a story. There are certain key words that get you keep, that not only focus you on what's being talked about, but that guides you through the story. There's a script that you can apply and plug in your own information and do it again. But the most effective storytellers we know are the ones who get the money, who get the opportunity, who get the experience because they've taken the time to reflect on what they do and have the empathy, have the compassion to think, okay, a complete stranger is gonna hear this story how can I convince them I am important and I need to be heard and I need to be invested in? That's going to be the second part is getting heard by an audience that isn't you, that isn't of the other people on your program and that isn't your loved ones. People, a complete stranger may even be someone you grew up with, but has no concept of why, why are you on this program in Israel? Why are you on, um, why are you in MITF in Batyam? Why are you studying abroad? Why are you on Schnatt? All these different experiences, why? Okay, not just, just because, or just because I grew up in that movement or I um, wanted to take a chance. Wanted to take a chance is a great story, by the way. I really wanted to do something different, or I wanted to take a chance, or I wanted to get out. Okay, why? Answering that why is gonna start building that story for you that's gonna be really important. So how do we document these things? So one, I'm gonna go through this very quickly, is social media. I don't need to talk about social media too much except to say a couple of things. One, yes, employers, yes, graduate schools, yes, undergraduate schools are looking at your social media feeds, whether you share them or not. So I'm sure you're all very conscious about what handles you do give out, what handles you don't give out. Um, but know that people are looking for you. When I was doing um, admissions for my graduate program, whether or not the applicant shared their social media feed, I would always, always Google them, always try to find their social media feed and not to see what they're sharing, but why they're sharing it and what platform. Um, it's a very important thing. because that's part of your public image. That's as important as some of the more conservative things like a CV res or resume or profiles elsewhere is your social media presence. Um, so if you haven't taken that time to go through your pictures and to filter out what's appropriate and what's not appropriate for complete strangers to see, please do that now. Like no judgment, but please do that now. Um, that may mean opening up a different uh, account. Sorry, I just got a question from Jonathan. Yes. Yes, oh, it should not be saying that. I'll fix that later. Um, other than Facebook, uh, hold on, let me rephrase that. If I only have Facebook that is publicly viewable, is that acceptable by employers in Israel or are they expecting someone to also have like Twitter, Tumblr, things like that? Great, that's a great question. So um, two things, one, when I talk about this, I'm also not just talking about Israel. So those of you who aren't necessarily interested in staying in Israel, no worries. This is applicable across the board, across the world. Facebook, great question. Um, Israel is the largest per capita user of Facebook. Um, that's just a given. Um, however, there are changes and we're gonna get into some of the different platforms right now. Um, 
what I always tell people, and this is part of how you document yourself, you pick the platform you're most comfortable with. If you're more comfortable with Facebook, you stick with Facebook. If you are comfortable with Twitter and all that Twitter entails, we're gonna go through some of the major platforms together, but if you're comfortable with Twitter, by all means, go for it. Um, part of what I'm asking you to do about document, documenting your experience is also within your comfort zone, and that's a big conditional asterisk around what, you, what I'm saying here. I'm not asking all of you to open up Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, LinkedIn, blah, 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 TikTok, Snapchat, all the other ones. I'm not. I'm asking you to pick one or two that you're the most comfortable with for the reason as follows. Um, every, almost everyone has a public profile. The people who don't have it for understandable reasons, whether they're in a service that requires a lot of um, uh, confidentiality, or they're doing what I'm saying now. They have a public profile that shares a minimal amount, and then they have a private one that they only share with certain people. Either way, be aware that, be aware and, and more important, take control of your public image. Um, people consider these social media networks as a utility. They treat it like it's electricity or water or any public service. These are not public services. These are private companies out to make a profit. And they're dependent on whatever data you feed them. So if you've never been taught this before, definitely be mindful of what you're sharing to these um, platforms. So let me go through some of them and explain the differences. Again, this might be obvious to a lot of you. Um, but like I say, employers, whether they're in Israel, whether they're in the United States, whether they're in Europe, whether they're in East Asia, they're all going to be looking for your social media feeds. Have something. Okay? Have something. What are the different advantages and disadvantages of these platforms? Let's just go through the major ones. You know them already, but from a professional and academic perspective, as someone who's done not just act, um, admissions for an academic program, but I used to run this PR agency and I used to hire and fire people, let me tell you some of the things I'm looking for and I don't want to see. So Facebook. Facebook is People argue it's getting old. I'm inclined to disagree. One of the advantages of Facebook is how multimedia it is and how interdisciplinary it is, right? You can post text, photo, video, link, all that stuff. You have groups, you have pages, you have all sorts of different ways to get your message across. It has great opportunity to share all sorts of different media um, and to create conversation about that media that you're inviting people in to have a conversation with you that you can control. I think that's an important part of understanding, documenting your experience is understanding people are gonna be viewing you and there's the risk slash opportunity that they can comment on what you're doing. How does that apply to um, Israel? So let's say you are doing career Israel and you wanna document your experience in, uh, interning at a certain place. There's a lot of different ways you could do this with Facebook. One is just to have it on your regular feeds, right? You could have a photo album of all the different experiences that are related to Israel and or your internship placement. And it's tagged like that. So every time you upload to your Facebook album, it's part of that. And the description in your Facebook album is um, sharing my various experiences in Israel as part of Career Israel, interning at blah, 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 blah. And each of those photos is then annotated with a caption, what it means, why it's important, why are you sharing this with a larger audience? Um, and you can obviously put privacy controls around that. Who's seeing this? Is this public? Like anyone can, with Facebook can see this? And remember, Facebook isn't just Facebook. It's also, excuse me, cross-listed on Google and other search engines. So you don't need to have just a Facebook account to be able to access that information. Maybe it's in your feed. Maybe you're doing a um, vlog. Maybe you're videoing yourself once a week, a few days a week, and you have a Facebook video feed that you're constantly adding to. Facebook allows multimedia, allows instant connection with people around the world. It's, I think, one of the better platforms to really document your experience. It's also one of the most dangerous platforms to document your experience, because how many of us have been tagged in a photo that's inappropriate? 
or is a lot of fun, but is inappropriate for other people to see, potentially including uh, potential employers. How many of us don't know what the privacy controls of Facebook are? And so you get into these sticky situations where, yikes, um, they saw something they probably shouldn't have. Or my friend tagged me in something not realizing that, and I didn't do it because I didn't know my privacy controls. There's a lot of freedom and a lot of danger with that freedom with Facebook. That's one. Let's say you are less text focused. Let's say you prefer um, something more visual, video, photo, um, collage, something that you can um, put together. Even if you're not artistic, even you are artistic, by the way, and we we'll all have our creative moments. Um, but even if you don't define yourself as either a creative or an artist, or whatever, there are those platforms out there. The obvious one is Instagram, right? Instagram allows us to create visually arresting content that people can consume around the world with the hashtags, with tagging other accounts on it. And we can document our experience, not just through one scroll like Facebook does, but we can have that mosaic on our um, page that is very arresting. If you know how to use Facebook, uh, Instagram, well, if you use those different tools that make mosaics or make grids, you can make really beautiful stuff on Instagram that's arresting and creates conversation and creates interest in who you are. You don't have to be um, a creative or an artist, by the way, to use Instagram to that effect. Um, if you are in um, a government fellowship program and you are interning at one of the Israeli ministries, you could easily use Facebook to document your experiences through video and audio. That could be amazing for people. Taking them on a virtual tour of where you intern. Here's my desk. Here's what I do on a regular basis. Create awesome content that's really interesting for people, captures your experience, and explains through your uh, capturing what is important to me. What gets me excited? Why did I take you know, an hour or two to create this video for you to see. How am I showing my passion through this? Instagram is a great opportunity for that if you know how to use it as well. Again, just like with Facebook, it has its own ups and downs. Instagram really depends on you sitting there and doing the hashtags, following other people's hashtags, commenting on them. It's very labor intensive. Um, another one, if we're talking about labor intensive, is Twitter, right? Twitter, I do social media strategy and management for some of my clients. And I tell them, a lot of them instantly say, well, what about Twitter? You need to be on Twitter. And I say, really? Here's what Twitter entails. Twitter entails you posting four to five times a day, you following other people and commenting on their feed, and constantly feeding the feed and other people's feeds over and over and over and over again. I personally, and I tell my clients this, I hate Twitter. I get the need for Twitter, but I am not a news agency. I am not glued to my phone. I, I am glued to my phone, but not to that extent. Um, Twitter works depending on who you are and what you're doing. Israelis are recently getting into Twitter, um, but they're still not consuming media on Twitter the same way that they are on Instagram and Facebook, for example. That's Israel. Other places are different. Americans love Twitter. But again, for Twitter to work, quote unquote, work to your advantage, for it to be efficient, to, for it to propel you, for it to document everything you do, you have to feed it a lot. It's not like Instagram. It's not like Facebook. You have to feed it so much on a regular basis. Um, so Twitter is great if you have the time. You all have the content. I showed you that, that spreadsheet of how to parse out all the different experiences you've had and then turn them into hard skills. You all have content. It's the question of what platform is right for me, not just in terms of how much time I have, but my comfort zone. How transparent do I want to be in front of other people? One more, and then I want to get to a little bit more quote unquote professional, but I don't want to really call it that. Um, one that people don't think about a lot. Um, there are actually two, there's quite a lot people don't talk about. One is Tumblr. Tumblr is around. Tumblr is equally um, interdisciplinary, and you can post a lot of different things there, and you're not necessarily looking 
for people to communicate with you, although it can be that, it's really meant to be a portfolio. It can show all the different experiences, thoughts, short form, long form that you have. The other one I encourage people to actually to look at, and this is similar to um, Instagram in that it's very visual, is Pinterest. Pinterest is usually about collecting different things and creating a mood board or sources of inspiration. But you can upload your own content to Pinterest. You could have October 2019 Israel and have that be one mood board within Pinterest. And again, it's all curated, video, audio, text, all the different things you have. You could do it by month. You could do it by location. If you're on a program that goes from one place to another, or from a workplace to a different workplace, or from a NGO to another NGO, you could use this to put everything together and you could document everything you've done along the way. You're also not being expected to be a master photographer. If you go onto my social media feeds, and you're welcome to, by the way, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Pinterest, I haven't used my Pinterest in quite some time, Tumblr as well, but on Instagram, it says very little about some parts of my life, and it says more about other parts of my life. Um, and I've never taken a professional photography class. I just figured this stuff out on my own of where the light needs to be and what also content I want to consume. What's a aesthetically pleasing photo to me? What looks good? What doesn't look good? What would I want to look at someone else's? How can I recreate what they've done? And so I get all these, sometimes, not all the time, get compliments on my photos. I'm like, thanks. It just happens to work out like that. It happens to be also I'm passionate about what I share. I don't just share anything. It's about something that's passionate to me. The same is being asked of you in this. How do you document yourself? You document... Number one, the format that's most comfortable to you. If that's Facebook, if that's Instagram. That could also, by the way, be medium.com. That could be a more traditional blog, like text-based with some photos posted, placed in. That's another great place to do it. Um, another one could be, though, is, is the, not just the format, but it's the content. What am I passionate about sharing and why? Why is this important to share with someone else? Why should I have them listen to, take a minute or so to read this or to watch this or to view this? Um, what am I trying to share about my experience that says a lot about who I am and what I want to do? That's what these portfolios can be. And I was teaching this in the context of a internship program that um, NYU's study abroad site here in Israel has about you don't have to be the most creative person out there. You are creative in your own way. And all of us are. That, by the way, isn't some fluffy comment. We really are creative in our own ways. Um, don't let people who are in fine arts programs tell you otherwise, by the way. It's a terrible thing. It's a terrible stigma to believe that we're not creative. We all are. Um, but these portfolios are integral because they, are, they enrich traditional ways that we communicate who we are. And we're going to get into the traditional ways right now. Um, but I want to emphasize that again. If you're not already curating... And curation is a big word that we hear in the arts world. But curation is also a word that needs to be used for this. How do I transform an experience I've had abroad or from a different one community to another? I curate the experience. I take people like a curator does in an art museum or in a natural history museum. I'm the curator. I'm taking you on a trip with me and sharing the different experiences that I had and telling you why they were important to me or why this was great, why this was terrible and what this has to do with my life and what, what do I feel comfortable in sharing with you that's relevant or not. So curation is important. It's not just throwing everything at the screen and uploading everything and hoping someone will like it. It's taking the time to why, editing, putting in the captions, explaining, having a conversation, the curation is no less important than the actual content and the format, whatever platform you pick. So those are social media. We have another social media form, and then this gets into traditional ways that you document your experience. The more conservative one is LinkedIn. If you don't have a LinkedIn profile by now, you need to open one in the foreseeable future. LinkedIn is your online CV resume. Um, 
people, some people only look at LinkedIn. And even if you send a traditional CV or resume to a graduate degree program or a professional program or to another Masa program, um, they're going to look at your LinkedIn. They're going to see, do you have a LinkedIn? They're going to see what you put in there and what you didn't put in there. Is that the same as your CV or resume? What else are they adding to it? Are they adding comments? Are they adding um, updated information? Are they, um, what else are they feeding LinkedIn that connects them with other people? Now LinkedIn, again, is a very labor intensive platform. Um, it can also be, by the way, very expensive if you upgrade your account. And I'm not suggesting that you do. I want to take you through my um, LinkedIn page, some very basics that's going to get to um, more to uh, two other traditional ways to document yourself and to share yourself. But also, LinkedIn is a great way to start networking. And networking is a word you may have heard before. Um, you may think that has to do with people in stuffy clothes, in three-piece suits or two-piece suits. Um, in young professional meetings asking you for blah, blah, blah money. That's not networking. I'm going to take you through some networking opportunity, potential networking opportunities. We're going to start online um, with uh, LinkedIn. So let me just open up my account. Share. Closed it. Where is my LinkedIn? Okay, so here's my LinkedIn. Let me open up the public profile. So LinkedIn, if those of you who are, who've done this before, haven't done this before, um, there's two very important, there's several parts of your LinkedIn profile. I'm not gonna do the part where it's your CV, which is everything, your experience. See, I'm just scrolling through it. We're gonna get to my, resume in a second, your education, your volunteer experience, projects, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of information you can feed LinkedIn. But the very first things you see on the LinkedIn page, and this is probably the most important, is the headline and the about section. The headline is a very short piece that says who you are. Why am I on LinkedIn? Why do I want you to look at my LinkedIn page? And this is a place where most people, not most people, many, many, many people make a mistake. And I'm sure some of you have done this as well, and you do this on your CV as well as you do this here. Tell me if this sounds familiar to you. Ambitious and individual seeks new opportunities. Um, real go-getter uh, with great people skills looking for the next opportunity. Those are the most boring sentences in the English language. And when you translate them to other languages, they're no less boring. And myself, as in charge of admissions or in charge of an employer in a company, hiring, I will look at that, I will roll my eyes, and I'll already make a mark against that person. That is such blah conversation when you have the breadth and depth of your life experiences. And the very first thing you're making me read is, Go getter interested in new opportunities. People oriented person looking for looking to use their skills. What does that tell me when everyone not only is saying the same thing that says nothing about your actual skills that has nothing enticing me. So look what I wrote here. This is not the best example, by the way, I change it every once in a while founder at Hayati comma, providing tailored solutions for local talent. Okay, what does that mean, tailored solutions? Who is local talent? I'm already causing the person who's reading this to ask questions. Whether they want to read on is up to them. But the fact is I'm asking, I'm making them ask questions about myself. And if they want to get them answered, they know they have to read more or to get in touch with me. Automatically, I'm drawing people into a conversation by explaining a little bit more about what makes me unique, what I'm doing, what I'd like to be doing, um, and why that's potentially relevant for the person who's reading this. That's that headline section. We're going to get back to that in a second when we get to another part of the more traditional ways that you document yourself and, and network. 
And then I have my about section. First off, it's all in the first person. I had to tell a recent client, um, you need to change it. It needs to sound like you wrote it, even if your secretary wrote it. It can't be rabbi blah, blah, blah. It needs to be I. Um, and I explain what I do. And I explain why I do the things I do. I explain what else I do. I have a little tongue in cheek thing at the end, PS, because LinkedIn is notorious, just like Facebook, of getting friends and connections with people you have no idea who they are, and they're trying to sell you something, or they're hitting on you, or God knows what they're doing, right? It's a little cute, it's a little tongue in cheek, may not be relevant for everyone, but I do it because it's part of my business. LinkedIn is a great opportunity to already start networking online, right? To already let people know who you are and what it is you want to be doing. And LinkedIn is your virtual CV and resume. It is everything about you that in one page, and let me show you my CV. Let's see if I have it open. I don't. Sorry, where is my CV? Aha. My CV. So here's my CV. Um, it's, a one, it's a standard CV. We're going to get to this and why, and LinkedIn in a second, why the two are connected. I'm going to jump a little to CV first before we get back to that, or resume, whatever you want to call it. Um, LinkedIn is great about doing a little bit more long form, and it's based on the CV format, on the resume format, which is a very simple format. Who you are, how to get in touch with you, what I've done. That's all you're doing. It's your one page calling cards. A few things about this and get back to LinkedIn to help you use that because it's a very important skill, especially um, when we don't know when we're next get to meet people in person. So all the more you can document who you are and what you've done online, the better. And LinkedIn is a great resource for that. So let's start with the CV or resume because that's what LinkedIn is built on. First off, it's my name and how to get in touch with me. A couple of things I see people make mistakes about all the time. First off, there's no mission statement on a CV. Don't do it. If you are applying for a job, if you're applying for graduate school, if you're applying for undergraduate school, you'll have the cover letter, you'll have the essay, you'll have the opportunity to explain why I'm applying to things. I'm gonna to get to that. That is not what the CV is for. The CV is a curriculum vitae. It is a list of your life. It is what you have done up till this point and what you are doing right now. Number two is my contact info. How you can reach me, not my address. Most people make the mistake of putting their address on it because someone told them at some point to put their address. Do not put your address on it. Number one, if you're applying for a job internationally, putting your address on there says, I'm actually not interested in this because I'm not living in that place. If you are really passionate about a job or an academic program, you'll move for that job or you'll ask for money to help you move for that job. Don't limit yourself ge geographically by putting your address on it. And also, privacy. You have no idea who's going to see your CV or resume. You have no idea who's going to see your LinkedIn profile. Don't give away too much personal information if you don't need to. Your mailing address, where you live, that is the last thing you need to be giving out in this day and age in anywhere. So if it's on your CV resume, be forewarned, take it off immediately. Now, people will tell you different ways to make your CV and resume. Some say do your employment, Experience first, some will say you're academic. Here's what I'll tell you my experience. First off, there is no one CV resume format for everyone. You should never be using one CV or resume for all experiences you're applying to. You should have different ones for different experiences because different places are looking for different things. An academic program is looking for something different than a graduate, than a graduate degree program, which is looking for a nonprofit job versus a for-profit job versus one in the Jewish world versus one in the business world. They're all looking for different things. You need to change your CV accordingly for them to hear you, right? We're talking about how to be heard in this workshop. So mine right now is employment-based. It's what opportunities I can network myself in, excuse me, for career advancement or other opportunities through my current business. So the way I do that is I put employment at the top and I list my experiences chronologically going backwards. So I start with the most recent, and then I put no more than three bullet points after everything, right? 
Um, and the way I do this, if, again, this may be um, repeat for some of you, but the way I do it is very simple. Almost every bullet point is going to be with what we call the gerunds, the ing. So you see these action words, empowering, managing, leaving, overseeing, managing, assisting, and so forth and so forth. It shows I actually did something there. It's not just responsible for. Responsible for is great. But you need to be saying what I actually did on the job, what I did in um, Career Israel, what I did in uh, Bina, what I did in Pardes, what I did at Rothberg, what I did at so forth and so forth. Um, you need to show what you actually did, not just I went on an experience. I've seen those CVs. They immediately go in the trash. Show what you actually did. Take the time to do that list we did at the beginning and turn them into action statements. Empowering local entrepreneurs around the world who seek global exposure. Amazing sentence. Doesn't have to be you because that's not your opportunity. That's not your experience. But it doesn't mean you didn't do something any less meaningful for the audience you want to be heard at. Okay? Experience, employment, I keep it to the last, um, no more, absolutely no more than 10 years. This is already getting to 15 years. It's a bit much, um, but because everything is two to three bullet points and because everything fits so neatly together in the narrative I share for myself, I leave it on there. Um, it soon will be, I'll need to take certain things out. Also, this is a very important thing when I say take things out. You don't have to list everything that you've ever done on your LinkedIn and your CV. You don't. If there are gaps, it's okay that there are gaps. We'll talk about gaps in a minute. Um, but it's okay if there's a break. So you'll see here, for example, I have a break between when I worked for Taglit up until August 2006 and when I worked for the Jewish Agency in 2009. Now, part of that is answered when you go beneath to see that I was in graduate school. Part of that is I'm choosing not to share what I did during that time. Um, part of it are job experiences that are simply not relevant for um, the place I'm applying. What I did during that period, I was the assistant manager at um, American Apparel when it used to exist in Jerusalem. That is completely inappropriate and irrelevant for most of the places I'm gonna be looking to do business with or to work for or to work with. So I just don't include it. If you have those gaps, it's okay to have a gap. Um, the gap is perfectly all right, but you need to have a story or you need to have an explanation of what you did during that time. And if you don't, we'll talk about that as well in a second. Okay, so I moved down. Now for me, what I'm doing in addition to working for a living is no less important for where I am right now. So I put my volunteer opportunities in social entrepreneurship. I've started a couple of different social ventures. Since moving to Israel, I volunteer in Israel. That's no less important of what I do for, for profit as it is my, my general um, interest in life. So I put them next. Education for me comes next and then languages. This should be a skeleton for the vast majority of you. Um, if you're from the European Union, please do not use the uniform CV that they ask you to where you put in your driver's license and your proficiency with software. Do not do that. If you're applying for anything outside the EU, do not do that. Um, it's a nice chuckle on our parts when we see those um, standardized EU applications, but don't do it. And likewise, and this is another thing that EU um, uh, applicants typically do, is include a picture of themselves. If you're not prompted to send a picture, do not send a picture. In Israel, that can lead to sexual harassment, that can lead to bias in the workplace, as well as in other countries, by the way. Um, and you can be discriminated against based on your picture. Why set yourself up for something like that? Don't send your picture. Don't give too much information. All of this that we're asking, I'm asking you to do now, to document your experience in Israel, to share what you're doing, 
is to invite people to a conversation, whether it's liking and commenting on your photo in Facebook, whether it's adding you on LinkedIn, whether it's um, inviting you to an interview for a job or for a, a further academic degree, you are trying to get into that next step. Um, and all the more reason to give as little information that's no less enticing, that's juicy for a person to read and to want to know more. I'm so interested in hearing about you, Jay, and how this all fits together. Um, when's a good time to talk on the phone? This is really, really interesting information, Jay. When can we meet for coffee? That's what you're looking for. You're looking for that in to then explain yourself a bit more. So this is one example of a CV. I want to go back to, um, uh, to LinkedIn. It's the time that we have remaining before I answer your questions to get to the next part. The last part I want to talk about, um, which is about networking offline and online, is this headline here. Right? This headline is meant to be attempting. How do I summarize where I am right now and what I want to be doing? This is not the place to say um, interested in new experiences. Define what those new experiences are. I'm looking for um, new opportunities in the field of immersive experiences in Israel. I'm looking to channel my um, experiences into something more uh, blah, 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 blah. This is that place to do it and to do it even more succinctly than that. And this gets into um, the summary and the about are very connected, right? The summary is the very short form of what the about is. And we have another version of this in um, networking and documenting your experience for um, professional and academic reasons. And that is something called the elevator pitch. The elevator pitch, for those of you who aren't familiar, I'm going to give you the, the classic scenario. You are um, working on a project or you're looking for a job. You're really passionate about something. You've already taken the time to know who you really want to talk to. Who are the people who are hiring? Who are the people who are your role models? Who are the people who could potentially unlock opportunities with them? You're going to some random meeting in an office building. You get into the elevator, and just as the elevator closes, a hand reaches in, opens the door, and who stands in front of you but that person you've been dying to meet and to talk to, okay? You press the second floor, they press the fifth floor. You have between the ground floor and when you get off to explain who you are and why you want that meeting with them. The proverbial, it's the proverbial, what we call the elevator pitch. How do you explain who you are and what you wanna do in as little time as possible to get people to that conversation? The elevator pitch is typically spoken. Hi, my name is Jay, I'm the founder of Hayati, which provides blah, 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 blah. I, through my company, I'm looking to blah, 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 blah. That's the typical elevator pitch. The unique thing about LinkedIn is that you can do that right here. The summary, is that three sentence elevator pitch, and we're gonna go through it very shortly. Condensed, super condensed, and your about section on LinkedIn is explaining all three parts of your um, elevator pitch. So it flushes out a little bit more of your summary. And what are you flushing out here? Number one, who am I? Hi, my name is Jay Rosen. What am I currently doing? I am the founder of Hayati, comma, blah, 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 blah. Third part, why is this relevant for the person I'm talking to? What am I trying to change in the conversation from something that's relevant just to me to something that I need their input in? I need their participation in. I need something to happen next. Who am I? What am I currently doing? What I would like to be doing or what I would like to get there. So if it's a graduate student like I do for Tel Aviv University, Hi, my name is blah, blah, blah. I am currently studying for a master's in conflict resolution with a focus in um, group dynamics. And my plan is to utilize this um, skill set um, in the field of blah, blah, blah. Or with the help of um, further 
academic uh, studies, I plan to blah, 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 blah. This is the place where you're bringing the other person in. You're explaining very quickly who you are. Um, you're making it short, by the way. If your program has a really long program, learn how to say it very concisely. Um, and keep in mind, it's a complete stranger. It's not someone who knows who you are, much less the program, much less Israel. Don't ever assume, even if you're speaking to the Jewiest of Jew, that they know what Messiah is, that they know what career Israel is, that they know what city abroad is, that they know what the Jewish agency is. There are many people out there who have no idea, nor are you, why should you waste what few seconds you have in introducing yourself or what few seconds they have in seeing your LinkedIn thing on explaining that program. If they're interested in that program, they will go and look for that program, okay? Don't worry about that. Worry about selling yourself first. I am currently studying um, conflict resolution in Tel Aviv University. You don't have to say it's a graduate program. You can, you don't have to. I'm currently interning at Amdocs as part of, um, as part of a career enrichment experience in Israel. Great, I didn't have to say Career Israel or one of the other internship programs to say that. I didn't have to say Masar, the Jewish agency. They'll do the research to find that. Don't worry about sharing everything. What am I doing and how do I need to get there? It's that third part you need to think about and you need to have in your heads. Um, and if we have more time and if we do this again, this is a great opportunity to practice together this third part, because this third part is not only important about bringing in the other person for a conversation. Like I said about CVs and resumes, this is the part that needs to change on a regular basis, right? Because what I'm looking for from the admissions of a graduate degree program is different than the admissions of an internship program or a fellowship or this job versus that job. It needs to change. So when I'm interviewing, when I'm connecting, when I'm networking with someone, this third part needs to change based on who I'm speaking to or whom I'd like to be speaking to. Um, who I'd like to be doing, what I'd like to be doing, not who. What I would like to be doing and or how do I need to get there? What does this person have that I would like access to in order to move forward? You may think that sounds conceited. People love to talk about themselves. I'm asking you to talk about yourselves. Other people love to do the same. I'm asking you so when I ask someone, please share with me your experiences in blah, blah, blah. I heard that you did the um, same internship experience that I did. I would love to hear about your experience and what you're doing now and how it connected. People will love to talk about themselves. They always do. This is an opportunity for you to glean information from them and to utilize that to push yourself forward. Okay, with that, I'm gonna take a break. Um, I definitely want to get to your questions right now. Um, if any of you in the course of asking questions, by the way, would like to practice your elevator pitch, would like to practice any of the things we go to, we have a little bit of time waiting for that as well. So let me stop share. And questions. Um, uh, regarding a brief personal statement at the top of the CV, I heard a conflicting view that recruiters want you to make it easy for them to see an overview very quickly. Can you elaborate on why you think this isn't good? Especially if you encourage a headline and about me on LinkedIn. Great question. Okay. If an, a specific employer in the application is asking you for the headline, do it. Do whatever they ask you to do. But the default is not to put that headline. First off, for the reason I said before, no one CV should be the same for every opportunity you sent which is why that gobbledygook generic statement of looking for new opportunities, throw it out. And people are so dependent on that, they think they can just have one CV because that one statement is there and that shows enough interest. It doesn't, it's boring. I'm bored to read that. You have other opportunities. If they tell you we're X, we're, we have a lot of applicants for this, please find a way to make yourself relevant. Um, you should do that through your own experience. If your experience doesn't show why you're relevant for this position, you need to make it relevant. You need to change the language that's in your CV or resume. You need to highlight the things that are more relevant and put that at the top. So if that's your educational experience, you put that at the top. If it's your professional, you put that at the top. If it's your volunteering, you put that at the top. 
Psychologically, people are looking, when they're reviewing hundreds of CVs and resumes, much less any information, they look at the top lines and then they decide if they're gonna read more. Even if they say they're reviewing everyone, it's nonsense, they're not. They're looking at the top things and you have to pull them in immediately. That's why that summary line at LinkedIn is so important. That's why this headline, if you're gonna put a headline in there, I'm not for it, but if you are gonna put a headline, you need to make it really enticing. Marketing language, you need to make it sexy. You need to make it someone is arrested, interested in reading this. If I read one more passionate individual looking for new opportunities, I will throw it out, if not shred it. You wasted my time, you wasted your time. So if you're gonna put that headline in, make it as perfect, as concise as possible. And if you can't do it, even better, tell your story in another way. Show other ways, get that person interested in who you are through other means that isn't that one headline. And frankly, and like I said this again about HR in Israel, any HR company, HR department that is basing your opportunities and your potential on one line is lazy. And maybe you don't wanna work there because they don't know what HR is. So, uh, da, 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 da. A personal question about what I studied, but happy to do that. Extracurriculars, great point. So if you are younger, if you are younger you, and or you don't have a lot of work experience, and or you don't have a lot of experience, but you have something else that's relevant, by all means put it on there. And this is where the gaps come in on the CV, right? I told you that before that there were these gaps. This is where not only your Israel experience comes in, what I was doing during this period, and here's where to find out more. Here's where it's documented. Um, extracurriculars are an important part. If you're practicing a language on Duolingo, that's an extracurricular. If you're part of an intramural sport, if you volunteer places, it may seem when you explain it to friends like it's no big deal and they joke. You have no idea what a potential employer or potential, excuse me, academic program thinks about that especially if you are the founder of it, or you can show proficiency in it, or you've been doing it for a long time, passion is more important here than anything else. This is really important to you. It's gonna be important to you whether or not you get this job, and hopefully the employer or the job or the academic opportunity will find a way to include you in that, right? So let's say you are really passionate about, um, I don't know, volunteering, and teaching English, and let's say you're back in America or your respective country, company may be interested in corporate philanthropy or corporate social responsibility. Even the most businessy, financially for-profit company may be interested in that. And this is an opportunity for you as a relatively new employee to say, I have a lot of experience in this. Who can I talk to about arranging us giving back through um, some English language help to students or to teaching um, children? or to helping out with those just, um, less fortunate. You've set yourself up professionally and you've already set yourself up just starting out um, showing what passion you have and that you're gonna be doing this regardless or not. Let that company invest in you as a result. So definitely, if you are the president of something, um, clubs in college, if it's only if it's been recent, by the way, or you want awards for it, in some forms of my CV, I put that I won um, service award medals in my undergraduate. My undergraduate is now quite a while ago, um, but it's no less relevant if I'm applying for leadership positions or if it has to do with Israel advocacy. Um, it really, it can help. It can flush out who you are and what you've done. Um, and it can also help fill in those gaps. And by the way, if you feel like you have those gaps now, Find a hobby and do it. Duolingo, by the way, is a great way to start. Um, those of you who are looking to help with your Hebrew and you have an Android, I have an even better app for you. It's called WordBit. It is an amazing app to learn Hebrew. WordBit Hebrew, sorry, not sorry, Apple users, but it's Android only. It is an amazing tool, um, all sorts of levels, all sorts of practical modern Hebrew words. I, I volunteer to teach Hebrew to fellow Olim, it's the most practically minded Hebrew I've found so far that isn't me teaching how to read a um, electric bill. So 
do something, learn a, learn a complete different language. I'm teaching myself Turkish, not just for the mind mess of it, but I can put that if someone is asking or who knows who I'm going to talk to. And I sprinkle in a few words of Turkish and they're, you know, who are, you never know who you're going to reach. All the more reason to put it within reason, right? If it's a leadership position, 100%. Um, okay. Uh, so great question about that. Another question. I have a question about when to include past experience in politics. I've heard conflicting opinions of it. Some saying it shows leadership abilities and some saying it might compromise a possible job. Great question. So I've been in this position before. Um, if you go over my resume, you'll see I have that a lot of people said I need to go into politics. That's a whole other conversation I'm happy to have with people. But what I'll say is the following. Um, Part of politics is not just your adherence to an ideology. It's also about compromise. And that's the case whether, regardless of what job you work in. So what I would say, if it's a particular political job and you're looking for something outside of that movement, for example, if you are an American and you are looking for a job in a politically minded think tank and you were the head of your Young Democrats Society, um, there are ways to refocus that. You don't have to say Young Democrats. You don't have to say what affiliation it was. You could just put a line, president of a um, national um, political movement, of a nationally affiliated political movement on campus, and then list what are the things you actually did without listing the specific ideology. And in everything else you're talking about, you're showing, not just through those skills, you're showing I'm able to be bipartisan. I'm able to talk about things that are outside my ideology, if that's what you're interested in. I've been in similar situations where I applied for a job and I did exactly that. And the employer said, well, you don't have enough experience with our specific movement, we're not interested. Frankly, in Israel, and ironic because this is a movement that's all about equal rights, it's against the law to discriminate based on ideology and politics. Um, I would have loved to have the time and energy to call them out on that publicly. It wasn't worth my time. The point is, you're selling yourself not through titles. Um, unfortunately, titles are very cheap. A lot of people have big, great names, um, but what they actually did with those titles is very meaning, doesn't have a lot of meaning. Show through the actions of what you're doing. That's why I can emphasize this portfolio. Documenting. Show what you did rather than rely on the title. So exactly this point. If you want to transition into, um, let's say you did schnat for one Zionist movement, and you're looking to get into national politics, and that movement, that politi political party is different than the, the tnua that you were in, or vice versa, Keep it to what you did during those, what opportunities you did during those um, uh, experience, that, that um, Masa experience, and or talk about what you learned from that and how it's applicable to somewhere else. I've gained valuable insight into public-private entrepreneurship, um, and I think this would be a great opportunity to help develop the young leadership division of blah, blah, blah part. There are ways to do it that transcend politics, that does require a little bit of nuance, does require a little bit of open-mindedness on the people you're applying to. And if they say no, that should say something good to you. You've done the effort to explain why you're the, you are the ideal fit for them. And if they can't hear that, maybe it's not the best place to be employed by because who knows what else they're not gonna hear you say. And maybe it's gonna actually be a very frustrating experience to be employed by them, no matter how amazing the job title is. Like I just said, titles, don't mean as much as the experience itself? It's a really good question, though. Um, especially coming from my world, not just from what I studied. I come from Washington, D.C., where it's all about politics. Um, but, and that bipartisanship is very hard to say. Um, yes, I'm going to type right here the name of that um, app. It's called WordBit Hebrew. It's free. Um, it is a great resource. It has daily um, vocabulary. It does tests. It has lots of levels. Um, what I like about Duolingo, if you don't use it already, is that it has um, audio as well as video, uh, audio as well as writing. WordBit has audio and it has sample sentences too. 
So you'll learn also a little bit of slang, which is really great. Um, Duolingo is not quite developed yet. Um, for that, WordBit is really good. Um, the last thing I want to say, oops, sorry, that didn't go to everyone. Everyone in meeting. WordBit, Hebrew, Duolingo. These are the two. Um, last thing I want to do, unless anyone has any questions, I want to give you my, um, this is my work email. You're welcome to be in touch. You're welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. It's okay. Um, you're welcome to connect with me on Facebook, uh, Instagram as well. I use them all very differently from one to another. If you want to review your CV really quick, I'm happy to look over yours and give you some initial notes. If you want to send me your written out um, elevator pitch, by all means, I'm happy to help you with that. Um, I really hope you take this time, wherever you are in your Israel journey, whether you're towards the end of it, whether you're in the middle of it, um, and like I tell the other programs I do this for, is to start thinking about the day after, well before that day comes. Because when the day after comes, you're going to be so overwhelmed by everything that goes into it. And in many respects, it's a little too late to start thinking about what's next and how do I sell myself. Take some time. Process what you've done already in Israel. Process what you'd like to be doing. How I can communicate this more effectively offline and online. How can I tell people about my experience? How can I show my experience? How can I tell the complete stranger what I did and why that's relevant for them to know about me? And practice it. Take some time and practice it. Start sharing with people, loved ones abroad. Even if you're in touch with them, maybe they don't know certain parts of what you've done over others. Maybe there's people in your home community that don't know what, you be, what you've been doing. Maybe there are other people out there who could, be, who could benefit from that. One of the greatest experiences I've had was going back to my high school, right? I went to a Jewish day school, full disclosure, I hated my high school. Um, socially, I came from DC public school and I went to suburban Maryland, very homogenous. Um, all the more reason I love going back and sharing why I was the last person to ever make Aliyah um, and my experiences in Israel and how that can benefit them already in their studies and before they come to Israel as upperclassmen in high school. You never know what kind of audience is out there. All the more reason to take the time to document yourself, curate your experience, and find a way to effectively communicate what you do, and it will sell yourself in ways that you never potentially even imagined. So again, um, thank you to Masa and Jewish Agency for allowing me to talk with you. Um, love to talk more with as many of you as possible. You have my email address. If you have any other specific questions, by all means, uh, be in touch. And wherever you are, especially here in Israel, I hope you're doing well. Um, anywhere around the world, I hope you are transitioning, especially those in Israel, in this weird, we're free, but we're not so free, period. I know it's difficult for me. Um, I know it's difficult for friends, but I really hope you're finding the time to take care of yourselves. Um, and it's a great opportunity to reflect on your experiences and how you can um, share them with a larger audience. So with that, take care. I uh, hope to see you all around here in Israel, in Tel Aviv, or anywhere in Israel. Um, and see you soon. Bye. Lehi